Hello, everyone, and welcome to the education session. My name is Wendy Daniels, and I'm faculty at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. It's one of nine colleges of Rochester Institute of Technology, and I am using ASL to present. For those of you who uh, depend on hearing, you probably can hear the interpreter interpreting for me now. So we do have two interpreters with us today, Catherine Lyon Wilson and Jason Rivera. We're having three talks in this session. If you want to ask any questions as you're listening, please type them in just whenever you think of it into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll respond to those. Once the three talks are done, we do encourage you to join us in the hubs room. We have three different rooms where we can go in and chat and mingle. Now, I'll let the deaf people know who are participating that of the three hub rooms, we'll be going to the first one, room number one, because that's where the interpreters will be stationed. So I'm happy to introduce our first group, students engaging, students a model for peer-to-peer -peer learning for XR tools and methods. And we have two presenters, Sebastian, um, from the University of Rochester and Megan May, also from the University of Rochester. So I'll hand it off to you too. Thank you. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so thank you so much for joining us here today um, for our presentation, Students Engaging Students, a Model for Remote, remote Peer-to-Peer -peer Learning for XR Tools and Methods. I am Megan Moody, the Immersive Technologies Librarian at, for Studio X on the Digital Scholarship Team at the University of Rochester River Campus Libraries. Uh, hello, and I am uh, Sebastian, um, a senior undergrad at the University of Rochester. Um, and I'm working as an immersive technologies developer through the TAR Fellowship Program and helping out Studio Ed by uh, developing workshops and software and stuff. And um, so this is a rendering of the planned Studio X space created by our architects at Canon Design. And uh, as the hub for extended reality at the Univers University of Rochester, Studio X fosters a community of cross-disciplinary collaboration, exploration, and peer-to-peer -peer learning that lowers barriers to entry, inspires experimentation, and drives innovative research and teaching in immersive technologies. So we have over 50 researchers across disciplines already working with XR at the University of Rochester in order to support their research and help students build new skill sets in these areas, Studio X will provide access to technology, space to work collaboratively, and expertise that lowers barriers to entry. Building a central program and space for support also makes sense because of the strong interdisciplinary nature of XR. Planning for the dedicated space included user experience research that articulated the need for different types of spaces within Studio X. So here is a floor, a floor plan. Um, so in the center is um, the salon, which is the heart of Studio X. Its purpose is to encourage exploration and learning. It includes an open area with a mix of tables and seating to promote collaboration and, and informal interactions that will help foster a sense of community. So all of the furniture is very lightweight. It's on wheels and can be reconfigured. Next, we have the innovation hub, or sorry, the innovation suite, which enables research intensive engagement and learning. It accommodates larger interdisciplinary research teams and includes access to high performance workstations and other specialized equipment. Then we have four collaboration rooms, two large and two small, which will facilitate XR exploration and creation that will be central to the work emerging out of Studio X. So here you can imagine PhD students mentoring senior XR capstone projects or groups working on a class project for a digital history or computer science course, for example. They'll all be able to book these rooms for the team meetings and long-term project work. 
Next, in the, the teal here, we've got the Learning Hub that supports formal and informal hands-on learning. This flexible space will host a range of workshops, classes, open office hours, and showcase events. Next, we have a space for dedicated staff, such as myself. And this will be here, um, able to work independently, but in close proximity to students and faculty who may need access to our expertise. And then lastly, we have six high-end workstations for individual exploration and project development. And then in, in addition to these spaces, we'll have a range of technology available for users. So I mentioned um, the high-end workstations, but we'll also have large monitors throughout and a range of VR headsets, mixed reality headsets, 3D scanners, 360 cameras, smart devices for testing, and a new addition um, in light of the pandemic is a UV disinfecting box. So all of these will be of use in the space, but many of them such as the headsets and, um, and some other equipment will also be available for lending to take outside of the library. So we were originally slated to open our 3,000 square foot physical space this fall. But of course, the pandemic really changed things for us all. I should also mention that I started my position at the University of Rochester at the end of February, which was an interesting way to start a new job, to say the least. And now we're looking at fall of 2021 when we'll be able to realize the space. This was a blessing in disguise in some ways. We have more time to get to, to test, to do more research, get feedback and build those meaningful connections and really be more thoughtful about, it, about managing hardware and safety during a public health crisis. And of course, we can continue to build our pilot programming for this fall, which we'll talk more about. And um, just you know, keeping in mind that Studio X is more than a physical space. But virtual, virtual reality, that was something we certainly hadn't anticipated. For a variety of reasons, the technology is, is costly. Um, sometimes you need high-end computers to run some of the software, especially if you're planning to teach this virtually, and then you have to run a Zoom on top of that. Then um, uh, access to stable internet, it's not always a given that our students are going to have that. Um, and something, sometimes access to something as simple as a mouse can be a real barrier uh, for learning a platform such as um, Blender, which is a 3D modeling tool. Uh, then the tools themselves are complicated. They have a steep learning curve. And um, it's not like I can walk around a room and see where folks are at when we're doing a workshop. I can't see if they're clicking in the wrong area or I can't like mimic the gestures for them as well as I could do that in, in, um, in real person. Um, and then if you've never navigated 3D space before, that also is, is a, can be a learning curve um, and is also difficult to show how to do that virtually. And then XR, a lot of folks still um, don't always see the value in it. They're, it. It's seen as a novelty sometimes. And so I think uh, building that community for XR and articulating its value, there's of course this, this additional barrier to really connecting and making those ideas clear for folks. So in thinking about these specific issues as well as navigating how to connect with uh, connect virtually with students, I worked closely with a team of student collaborators. Several of them were and are participating in the CARP Library Fellows Program, which is a new initiative to prepare students for life after graduation. Some of the students, such as Sebastian here, support Studio X's developers. Others have worked as our public programs coordinator to shape a community of practice around XR. These students have been involved in our programming at all levels. They've taught workshops, created informational videos, conducted surveys, designed out reach materials, supported office hours, and much, much more. Their diverse skill sets and perspectives have been invaluable. They're all at different levels with various 3D authoring tools and have shared their expertise and experiences as, as learners with their peers in inspiring ways. They also, of course, share their perspectives of what it's like to be a student at the University of Rochester right now and have helped me think creatively about how to build effective and engaging programming. I can also say that their enthusiasm and dedication to the project and immersive technologies have also been heartening during this very strange time of remote work. So in, pre in preparation for our fall programming, one of our first projects was to surface user needs. I conducted interviews with faculty across disciplines. And in particular, faculty indicated that students often lack both early exposure to XR as well as foundational skills with 3D platforms. 
For example, this poses a problem for participation in upper level coursework and engagement in senior capstone projects. 3D tools and platforms prevent a steep learning curve again, and if students had a better grasp of the basics, they could participate more fully in coursework and faculty research and make great, greater strides in their own projects. Faculty also emphasize this PR problem surrounding immersive technologies. Their value is not always readily apparent to new users who often can find them unrelatable or gimmicky. So this gap in knowledge was also clear from a student survey we conducted over the summer. Uh, we talked with nearly 60 students who participated and we asked them about their experience with popular XR platforms. Again, we see here that most students are unfamiliar with these platforms or at best have a very surface level understanding of them. Most students have not participated in the deep and deeper engagement with these tools. For example, very few have created something with them or taught them to another user. And many students expressed excitement about Studio X. They wanted to be looped in. They wanted to know more about the, pro the program. But when we asked students specifically how they might use XR to enhance their own learning, many did not have a clear answer and said something along the lines of this. I'm not really sure, but I want to learn more about it so I can think about how to use it. We realize that providing lots of use cases to demystify these technologies is important so students can grasp their possibilities and better relate to them. And lastly, we asked them specifically how they would like to be supported. And overwhelmingly, folks asked us for hands-on active learning workshops, which is what we tried to deliver. All of this feedback was very informative and helped shape our, our fall pilot programming, which Sebastian will now discuss. Uh, yeah, thanks, Megan. Yeah, so I'll just um, start out by talking briefly about um, the fact that we chose um, Unity and Blender, which are two uh, pieces of 3D software to begin our workshops with. Um, we chose those because uh, those cover like a huge part of the 3D authoring pipeline and we felt like those tools in particular um, would give students a real leg up um, in their future careers, uh, both as students later in the, in the University of Rochester and also professionally. Um, and uh, to help uh, motivate those workshops, we developed custom assets. Uh, so for example, um, in Unity, uh, for the Unity workshops, we all had um, in there already a uh, sort of a recreation of Eastman Quad, which is the main quad on campus with the library and everything. Um, and then we had some custom assets in the Blender workshop as well. Um, and I think those were important because um, being greeted with like a blank screen in one of those tools can be kind of intimidating. So it's, I think, useful to have um, sort of existing frameworks um, in there. Um, and then we also wanted to have sort of like playful workshops uh, so like people would see them advertise and want to join. So one of them was um, like uh, Dodge Zombies on the Eastman Quad. So like that was like a Halloween theme. Uh, that was kind of fun. Um, and yeah, and so we had um, a decent amount of collaboration with the library folks and then also some uh, students to help uh, promote those and develop those and present those to the uh, students, yeah. Um, so that was our plan going into it. Um, and then we iterated a couple times because we realized there were a couple issues with what we had planned. Um, the first one came from us wanting to uh, provide custom assets in the project. Uh, the problem with that is you have to worry about how large they are because we started out with the custom, like a fairly photorealistic custom version of Eastern Quad. And that was just like almost one gigabyte. And that was like way too much to ask students to download and run on their computer. So we toned that way down. Um, we downsized the textures quite a bit. Um, yeah, and that ended up working. Um, but still, it's something we had to balance because we wanted everyone, I, we wanted as many people as possible to be able to run the project, even like since we didn't have access to the high powered computers and studio ads. Um, yeah, and then the other, like another problem we had is um, just sort of how do you teach 3D tools um, online because um, sort of like one of the earliest learning hurdles in teaching 3D tools is just how to navigate the space, how to pan around the camera, how to dolly, how to zoom in on stuff. Um, and it's hard to teach those without the students being able to see your hand gestures on like the mouse. Um, yeah, so that was pretty difficult. Uh, the way we ended up doing it is just having students be able to share their screen at any time and sort of like walk us through exactly the problem they were having. Um, but again, like some students were, like that requires students to be really engaged in the workshop. Um, so that was a trade-off on that because 
uh, some people like didn't want to share their streams and yeah. Um, another problem we had was um, sort of like another problem with uh, having assets in the uh, file to begin with in the project to begin with is you have to make sure those are not complicated and are not and are hard to lose yourself in because like in Unity in particular, you can have like a ton of nested objects. And then if you expand one of those accidentally and then click into the one of those, it can be pretty difficult to like, as a new user to see like where you are in the project. So we had to name everything super clearly, make it very hard to get yourself lost in the project. Um, yeah, so that was another thing. Uh, we had to build the project for learning, not necessarily what um, the, like the best practices were in like an actual project, uh, yeah. Um, and then also we've had a bunch of people sign up for these workshops and then uh, not join. <laughs> so I think part of that is everyone's tired of being on Zoom all day because classes are on Zoom, clubs are on Zoom, everything's on Zoom. Um, so why would you want to do another hour long Zoom at 7 p.m.? So uh, I think that's something we've had to work through. We have had some decent engagement recently uh, after we moved the time from early in the afternoon to later in the afternoon. I think students in general prefer to do stuff later. Um, but yeah, that has been a problem. And then another one that we had feedback on is um, early on we were pitching the Unity workshops as gaming specific because it's a gaming engine. But in reality, um, it can be used for a ton of stuff that isn't gaming. Um, and like filmmaking, uh, construction, all, all like really the styles of living on that kind of stuff. and. So we started to pitch it more as a general use tool and we've seen some better results with that also. And sort of in that vein, um, one of the things that we heard on the survey quite often was that uh, people and students really needed um, us to demystify HR. Um, and one of the key ways we're doing that, I think one of the best ways to do that in general is to have really cool speakers from industry come in and talk to us. Um, so two really amazing speakers that Megan taught us was um, Hyphen Labs. Um, that's an international collective of women artists who do really cool um, both installation work uh, in like museums, physical spaces, and then also they have just like purely digital experiences. I highly recommend Googling them, checking them out after this. Um, and then the other one we had this past week was Carl Domingo from Unity. And that was really great. He gave a ton of examples of Unity and XR in industries that were not um, gaming. So that was great. Like he showed an, like an example video of like using AR to help build a skyscraper. So that was really cool. Um, and he's also an RIT alum. So he's from the neighborhood. Um, yeah, and then also another really big thing has been showing, like Megan mentioned at the beginning that we have like 50 professors or something working on XR in the University of Rochester already. So we've begun showcasing those projects on the website and also incorporating them into our workshops just to show kit, uh, students, here's stuff you could get in, involved in outside of Studio S, like look at all this cool stuff that's happening. Um, yeah, so that's also been good. Um, and then sort of outside of the workshops, you don't, like one of the things we want to happen is not necessarily have the, have the learning experience end with a workshop. We want to create a community space around the workshops. Uh, so we've been using Discord, the, the platform Discord for that. Um, our reason for choosing that was because a lot of students, especially ones interested in gaming, uh, already use Discord. And so sort of like uh, meeting students where they're already at in terms of uh, chat platforms, I think was a pretty good idea. And we've gotten some signups for it and it seems to be like I see a, a way forward into making that more of a community than it currently is. Um, and then we're holding our open hours or, or, or office hours on that where uh, me and then another student developer um, just pop in for an hour and then just um, sort of the pitch is like, or you can, you can ask us any question about Unity that you want in this sort of like free flow of time. Um, and we can like sort of help with any issue. Um, yeah. And then another uh, sort of community sort of engagement idea we had was a student um, came to the library and sort of suggested that we provide a space to uh, like, a, like a virtual space to mimic the sort of like um, way that libraries can facilitate like random happenstance like meetups like while studying. Um, so we had a 
something that you can see on the slide called the Dream University Challenge. Um, that's going to happen later this winter, um, where students sort of compete to in like Mozilla Hubs. I think we're thinking to develop like a virtual space, uh, sort of like for studying and just sort of like for social communication. So I think that'll be cool. Um, and I was a student that came up with that idea. So I think people are really interested in building community around these tools. Um, yeah, so we just need to figure out how Studio X fits into that. Yeah, and then uh, this is the thing that I tell people at my, at my workshops because uh, sort of programming and HR programming in particular where debugging is pretty hard can be kind of a slog, but I like to say uh, take joy in small successes because I think it's important to uh, be happy about things before you reach the end of the journey. <laughs> um, and then another thing we're trying to figure out is how to remove as many barriers as possible. That's really important with teaching HR online because inherently like there are a ton of barriers <laughs> because the tools are meant to be used like with a really high power computer, a ton of like, uh, <laughs> like knowledge already in hand. Uh, yeah, so we're trying to remove those uh, barriers as much as possible. Um, and then, yeah, and then so we're, we're trying to mimic the in-person studio atmosphere as much as possible with sort of like, um, like informal learning opportunities that are like serendipitous. Uh, I think Discord will really help with that in the future. Um, and we can't expect that community to be built all in one day, but I think we're making some cool strides. Um, and then we've just kept trying to involve students because students often come up with ideas that they would like to see happen. So yeah, we wanna make sure that those are the real uh, sort of like movers in our uh, vision, yeah. And yeah, so these are just, uh, we just would like to thank all the administrators, advancement people, faculty, ton of people across the library, a ton of students. Um, yeah, and they've been really helpful for getting Studio Rats off the ground. And of course, this doesn't even come close to touching everybody who's had an impact. But yeah, just thank you to everyone here. Uh, and thank you for listening. Uh, this is the Studio Rats website uh, that you can find um, a lot of more, a lot more info about Studio Rats, uh, a lot of the resources we have up there uh, for students. But I mean, there are curated good resources for learning at SARA. So if you're interested, um, and a lot of future events. Megan, if you have maybe a more cohesive. Um, I think that was actually great. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, uh, tons of resources, more info about what's going on. And um, yeah, so thank you all for joining us here. Well, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I do have a quick question. Um, is there a mailing list? where people can get information about upcoming workshops and events and yes. open office hours. So that was the one question, if you could address that briefly. Yes, absolutely. Uh, if you go to the StudioX website, there is a sign up for a listserv and all of the Discord information as well, which is where we're having the open hours. So please check that out. And thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I forgot to say that. So that's my fault. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you both. And now we'll move on with our next talk. All right, our next group presentation will be, the topic is actually eye tracking in virtual reality for education and technology research. So the people who are doing this is Jorge Baca Acosta, and then also, and he's at the University of uh, Conrad Lorenz. And then we also have Dr. Julian Tejeda, and he's from the Federal University in Sergipe, in Brazil. So yeah, feel free to take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, great. So good morning, everyone. So thank you very much, Wendy and Jason. Uh, I am very, we are very happy to be here. Uh, so my name is Jorge Baca Acosta. I am associate professor at the Conrad Lawrence University in Colombia. And here with my colleague, Dr. Julian Tejada, 
from the Federal University of Sergipe in Brazil. We are going to present this talk with the title Eye Tracking in Virtual Reality for Educational Technology Research. So thank you very much to, for, to all the people that make this event possible. And uh, I, I, I am very delighted to give the floor to Dr. Julian Tejada to start. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation. And we started talking a little bit about the uh, eye tracking technology. Please, Jorge, the next slide. Uh, well, the eye tracking technology is based on one of the most interesting characteristics of our eyes. And this is that they are always on movement and they movements are not flowing. As you can see, the eye on the image is moving in a small jumps from one point to another. We can imagine that this person is looking to a computer screen and uh, his or her eyes uh, represent or the jumps in his or her eyes represent the way in which the eyes explore the image on the screen to conform a mental representation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to understand this uh, process, uh, we can uh, imagine, for instance, that when you are reading the text on the slide, uh, your eyes will be moving in a predicted direction from left to right with small pauses, each uh, in average seven characters. These movements are, uh, I'm sorry, let me pass the... Okay, let's just, uh, just, just a moment. I live uh, near the, the airport, the, the airport, and sometimes these uh, things happen. But uh, let's return uh, to the example. Uh, so, uh, when you read uh, the text on the light, uh, your eyes will be moving in uh, two kinds of movements. Uh, one of them are operationally cited with a fixation. Uh, the uh, movements, the the movements in which the eyes are focusing a leather, and the other is called a uh, second uh, eye. But here it's very important to consider that the fixation doesn't means that the that the eyes stop, uh, because even when the gaze is focused on a character, for instance, the letter H on the beginning of the phrase, uh, the eyes are still moving, but their movements are smaller. Uh, these uh, smaller movements are represented on the slide in the bottom part, in which I put a smaller circles around the letter H and E, uh, to represent that the even in the fixation, the eyes, the eyes still are moving. Uh, next slide, please. With these two categories of movement, fixation and saccades, it is possible to characterize the way in which eye stimulus was explored, identifying, for instance, the local in which the gaze was fixed for the longest time, representing that as a heat map, as, uh, as is presented in the slide, in which the warmer colors, uh, in which the warmer the color, the longest time the gaze was fixed on that point. Uh, at the same time, due to the fixation and saccades are recorded with a time stamp, it is possible to recreate the eye trajectory over the stimuli and obtain a measure of order in which each stimuli were based. At the same time, the time stamp 
is spent over each. And you can see it is possible to see small numbers on the bottom part of the image. This is an example of somebody reading a Twitter post. And as expected, it is possible to observe an examination trajectory with uh, inverted C form, starting from the left to the right and uh, following with the next line. Uh, but next is uh, next slide, please. Sorry. But this kind of, of uh, summarization, this kind of character, character characterization of the uh, eye movements, it is possible to apply to uh, other kind of the stimulant, other kind of stimulant, other than text. Uh, for instance, in our words, we work it with a 3G environment. Uh, this environment is, is uh, to represent an office, and we record in the way in which the participants interact with the uh, instructions and a foreign language, and we record the team gazing the instruction and also the local in which they have to put a set of, bo of books. Uh, as you can see, it is possible to observe the gaze trajectory of, uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, infer how after listening to the instruction, the participant gaze the books on the table and after that, he or she looks also at a specific region around the table. And with this, we can represent not only the way in which the stimuli uh, was explored, but also the line of thought or uh, means, or, or I mean the way in which the participant understand the instruction. Next slide, please, for him. With this information, it is also possible Preparate heat maps to identify locals in which the gaze was fixed uh, for the longest time, and uh, as was shown previously with the Twitter stimuli. But all this information permits a um, uh, sophisticated evaluation with high precision of the participant performance uh, based on the uh, kind of resource that doesn't need previously previously training uh, because gaze is very natural response for most of us. And this is the, re the reason for which we use eye tracker. And I now I want to pass the word to my colleague Jorge to explain for you the tax. Thank you. Good. Uh, so uh, here we have, uh, uh, let, let's say, uh, the, the eye tracker. And in this case, we have an, uh, the eye tracker, uh, let's say, that is joined to the screen. And we can see what the student or the user is looking at in, in the screen. Uh, so here uh, we have an, an uh, let's say that another step, which is when when we when we use uh, virtual reality. So in the in that case, the eye tracker is included in the headset, and basically the eye tracker use uh, infrared sensors to detect the retina and the pupil, uh, and identify the eyes position and the eyes movement. So now let's see um, uh, how eye tracking works in virtual reality. So in virtual reality, it is more difficult to represent a heat map or a gaze path as, as we saw in the previous slides, because the user is in a 3D environment and the user constantly moves around the 3D envir environment. So it is uh, a bit more difficult to identify where the user is looking at at every moment. And it is more difficult to create a heat map because uh, we would need like a 360 degree image uh, to represent the gaze path or, 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 or draw the heat map. So some researchers uh, have uh, suggested one mechanism 
uh, that is to use, uh, from a more technical point of view, something that is called colliders uh, in the Unity game engine. So colliders are a kind of green boxes that are uh, around the 3D objects. And those colliders are basically used to detect collisions uh, in, in the Unity game engine. But we could use them uh, to define some areas of interest. So let's uh, take a look at this picture. Here we have uh, a, a 3D environment uh, with a sofa. And we have some small boxes, some green small boxes. Those are colliders. And what we are doing is defining that those are areas of interest because we were interested in uh, identifying if the user looks at that particular areas. Uh, so uh, we could use the colliders to define those areas of interest. So now uh, we could also combine colliders with something that it's called ray casting in Unity to identify which object the user is looking at. So this is a, a little bit more technical, but let's see. So uh, what we have from the eye tracker is uh, what, what, what we see here in the picture. We have the left gaze base point and the right gaze base point. Uh, those points represent the position of the eyes. Uh, here we have a small uh, dotted area with dots in blue. Those are the headset, those represent the headset, the, the, the virtual reality headset, such, such as the HTC Vive headset. And from those points, we could uh, create uh, left gaze direction vectors and the right gaze direction vector, which represent the direction where the user is looking at. This information is also provided by the uh, eye tracker inside the virtual reality headset. Uh, what we can do uh, from those vectors and points is to create a ray uh, basically, it's an invisible ray that is created from those vectors, and uh, it goes along uh, the direction of those vectors. And we can identify if, the, if those rays uh, collide with our green boxes or our colliders. So in that way, we can identify if the user is looking at those particular areas. We could, of course, uh, create colliders for the sofa if we were interested in identifying if the user is looking at the sofa or if looking at the cushions or any particular area in the 3D environment. So that's one of the strategies that, that we have used to identify uh, where, the user, where the user is looking at. So now we are going to see an example on how we use this technique for a, a research in the field of educational technology. So we developed a virtual reality application for practicing the prepositions of place in English uh, for English as a foreign language courses. So this is a short video of uh, this application. So this is the, the virtual reality environment. Uh, basically the user or the student is uh, inside a small room like an office and so he or she can move around uh, the, this, this environment. And uh, you can see a small uh, dot, a small green dot. Uh, that, that's the gaze point. So that's basically uh, what the user is looking at every moment. Uh, all of these uh, movements are recorded by the eye tracker and by the API that we used. Uh, so uh, the first step uh, in this application is the calibration process, the calibration of the eye tracker, which is basically uh, this process. The user uh, has to look at uh, this point and follow this point uh, so that the eye tracker can identify if, uh, if the, the, the gaze of the user. So after this calibration process, uh, right. So the idea of this application is that the student is going to hear, uh, is going to listen to uh, some instructions in English uh, using the prepositions of place. The idea is that the students can uh, practice those prepositions. So uh, we are going to continue Put with the, the video. Put the books under the table. So the student can uh, listen to the instruction. Put the books under the table. Up to three times. Put the books under the table. If the student doesn't understand the instruction, uh, he or she has the possibility of looking at the text written in the virtual reality environment. 
uh, he or she has two times uh, to look at this instruction. And we are recording every single movement of the eyes in the environment so we can see what the students look at when uh, they use these hints or this like of helps. Uh, so here we have the last, uh, let's say, hint that he or she has, which is uh, the written instruction and the preposition highlighted in red. And uh, the student can look around the VR environment, and uh, there is one moment in which the application shows the correct position of the object, and the student can take the books and put them in the correct place. Good job! And the application is going to provide, uh, uh, let's say, positive feedback or negative feedback, feedback in case uh, the, the location of the books was incorrect. So we, uh, we can use eye tracking to identify a, a lot of information, to get a lot of information about what the user is doing here in the environment. So we could we, we could know, for instance, how long uh, how long students devote their attention to uh, to any particular area in the virtual reality environment, or or how long the students devote their attention to any particular object in the VR environment. Uh, we could also identify what, what is the first object that students look at after a certain stimuli, for instance, listening to the instruction, reading the instruction. We could also see how students read the instruction, uh, what are the particular words they focus, they focus on uh, when they are reading. I mean, we, we can get a lot of information from this, uh, from, from, from the eye tracking technique. So, uh, okay, let me continue. Right, so this is an example of the data that we could collect from the eye tracker. Uh, we could identify the position of the left eye, position of the right eye, the pupil dil dilation, and well, a, a lot of information. This information is recorded almost every millisecond. So we, we can get files that are about, uh, let's say 30,000 to 60,000 lines of information. Uh, we could also, uh, let's say that filter information for particular areas of interest. In this case, we could see an example of, of that the gaze enters uh, an area of interest that we call hint button or when the gaze exits an area of interest that we also could, uh, that we also name it a uh, hint button. Uh, so uh, with this information, we can process all of this information. We created some scripts, uh, we process it all, all of this information and we could obtain some information like this. We have the three buttons that we saw in the virtual reality environment. We could identify the frequency of inputs uh, on those buttons. We could, of course, uh, get information about uh, how many times the user look at the correct position of the object or, or if the student maybe uh, look at any other object uh, apart from the correct position of the object, uh, we could identify the duration of inputs. I mean, how much time the student look at that particular object, uh, for which preposition in particular, the time to finish the task. I mean, the, the time that the student uh, spent uh, taking the books and moving them to the correct position and the number of errors that uh, he, had, he, he or she had. Uh, so uh, we, we have also another project that is uh, published in this chapter. You, you can access to that chapter. It's, it was a virtual reality application for learning uh, how to follow directions in English through a virtual reality environment. Uh, so you can access to that article from this QR code or using this uh, URL link. Uh, it is published in the book, Designing, Deploying and Evaluating Virtual and Augmented Reality in Education. And uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, the time is short, but we hope this would be helpful for you. Uh, these are our contact emails. And if you have any question, we will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Wow.
That's amazing. That's an amazing presentation, Jorge. And thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And also, I don't see any questions at the moment, but basically what that means is your presentation was so clear that everyone totally understood everything. So that was great. great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay. Great group. Great group. All right, so we're ready for the next group. The presentation is virtual. virtual. For characters and theoretical framework for developing interpersonal intrapersonal uh, skill sets in students. So the presenter's name is Miriam Rafihi, and she comes to us from the Virginia Commonwealth University. I'll hand it over to you, Miriam. Yes, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. All right. Um, um, so feel free to go right ahead. So I'm Miriam. I'm a researcher and educator and designer. And when I first became interested in working with Wikipedia, I thought that this would be a topic farther into the future. Turns out I was wrong. Um, we are about 11 months into a life-changing uh, pandemic. And um, I find myself holding discussions in VR um, and topics that I was interested in two years ago, such as resilience and engagement and empathy are now probably more relevant than ever, especially when asking whether we can offset at least some of the emotional and logistical impact of the crisis using virtual reality and education. So to be more specific, um, can virtual reality assist in increasing student achievement and well-being by affording the development of interpersonal, interpersonal, and intellectual character strength? Now the reason, well, now the reason um, we're focusing on these three categories of character strengths is that while character is plural, it is not infinite. And there has been scientific evidence for a tripartite structure of character in the context of education. What's even more interesting is that each of these three dimensions of character has been shown to correspond to distinct outcomes. So for example, interpersonal character, which includes gratitude and social intelligence, predicts positive peer relations. Intellectual character, which includes curiosity and zest, predicts class participation. And interpersonal character, which includes academic self-control and grit, predicts report card grades. So this research is referenced by the Character Lab, a non-for-profit organization that connects researchers and educator, educators. Um, and the Character Lab, uh, offers really interesting resources, but despite understanding how significant the impact of developing character strength is as an educator, I can speak firsthand to how challenging it feels to intentionally cultivate character in students. So I do believe that VR brings some, with it some untapped opportunities, which I'd like to present in three brief uh, cases or projects. So when I first, um, started developing VR applications, I was interested in creating experiences that would integrate into a curriculum to support specific learning objectives. And in 2018, I had the opportunity to work together with Qatar Museum, an organization focused on promoting and sustaining local cultural heritage. The project employed VR to complement a Qatar history curriculum by the Ministry of Education and simulated pearl diving one of Qatar's main industries prior to the discovery of oil. In the gamified VR Pearl Diver application, students could undertake an experiential learning task 
which is difficult to conduct in the real world, but relevant to the learning objectives. The students would embody the diver who must descend to depths of over 30 meters to find enough pearl oysters. And after the diver has ascended um, and is back on board of the boat, the next task is to open the oysters. And when users click on an oyster holding a pearl, depending on the size, the specific local name, which has cultural relevance and history, uh, such as Dana uh, for the largest pearl, appears in the virtual environment. So when promoting the adoption of this app in the classroom, um, we learned from conversations with educators that ease of use and content relevancy um, in that the app content supports learning objectives were the most important criteria that would either encourage or hinder someone to pick up the app. And um, to consider ease of use, we use regular smartphones with Google Cardboard Viewer, which were sponsored by Katja Museum. So the VR Pearl Diver application introduced students to a part of their history in a fun and engaging way. However, its use is obviously limited and um, to a specific curriculum. And at the time, I was wondering if it was possible to employ design strategies for immersive media that would increase engagement unrelated to a specific topic or curriculum. So beyond the visual aspect of immersion, 3D audio is an additional and substantial characteristic of a 3D learning environment. And inspired by the work of John A. Svoboda, a professor of music psychology at Keele University, I became interested in the potential impact of directional audio shifts on emotional engagement. So he related peak emotional experiences, this is a quote, um, on sudden changes in dynamics and texture of harmony, sometimes accompanied by a physical response such as chills. Um, and a potential explanation for this phenomenon is that in our evolutionary past, sorry, in our evolutionary past, sudden unexpected auditory changes usually signal danger. So that's where the chills came from. And the music, when giving us chills or goosebumps, essentially turns an ancient fear response into a source of pleasure. So this is not an emotional engagement based on musical piece that we have a memory with, but it's an emotional engagement based on an evolutionary um, part in our brain. Therefore, when music, oh, sorry. So um, to test um, this, um, to test if the shifts in audio direction would have a similar impact, Two colleagues and I um, created two scenes from 360 video footage uh, of a cl classical music concert by the Qatar Philharmonic Orchestra. And in the first scene serving as a control, the participants stood on the stage encircled by the music musicians. They heard the previously recorded performance in stereo audio. And um, we asked them afterwards um, how they felt about the piece. And the second scene that consisted of the same view, however, invisible speakers surrounded the participant, placed emphasis on different parts of the melody, thereby providing an almost unnoticeable shift in audio direction. And we again, after the VR experience, we um, asked participants to fill out a questionnaire to gauge their musical, musical pleasure as well as awareness of the audio direction. And when asked, um, users felt more involved with the musical piece that had, uh, on average, that had um, the shift in audio direction, even though those shifts were almost, were not noticeable. So this um, self-reported higher involvement with the musical piece is then a potential for higher engagement if this design strategy is applied in other scenarios. So, <laughs> The investigation into immersive design strategies for engagement continued in another project that used embodiment techniques for cognitive empathy. And employing a narrative-based approach, the intention was to allow users to build cognitive empathy for fictional characters whose experiences would be um, not possible or we wouldn't be able to have those in the real world. So in the VR experience developed, the user embodies a fictional character, which is Aladdin, 
Um, and in this role, it's faced with a task to enter the Cave of Wonders to retrieve the lamp. Aladdin enters the cave, the walls begin to move, closing uh, in and closing the way out and leaving the user locked in. And just as in the tale of 1001 Nights, um, in this experience, the user has the ability to, um, or has access to a magic carpet to help the user pass without harm and escape the cave. And once out in the open desert landscape, the user can experience a sense of freedom and reward riding, a magic car riding the magic carpet. So initially, the design of navigating the magic carpet with the HTC Vive left users feeling vulnerable and exposed because they had to stretch out both their arms to direct the carpet upwards out of the cave. Um, but in order to alleviate this feeling of vulnerability, and achieve that feeling of empowerment and freedom that we were aiming for, the mechanism to fly was amended. And even though it wasn't planned, an outcome of this project was the experience of working with users in six dimensions of freedom required us to have empathy um, for the user or for the uh, user's experience when we were designing it. So what I mean to say is that by designing the way a user moves in real space to interact with virtual space. I, as a designer, am choreographing the user's body movement, which allows him or her to feel either empowered or vulnerable. That gives me a lot of responsibility and power. Um, so the investigation also showed that not only do we have this responsibility, power in the way we design the user's movement and emotional state. It also showed us that um, when the user felt vulnerable, they weren't, or when users felt vulnerable, they weren't able to, um, so they weren't able to feel the problems or to have problems of empathy with the fictional character and they weren't able to engage with the, with the experience. So considering those three projects together, we can see what it might take to first employ virtual reality in the classroom, the potential design strategies for emotional engagement, but also the opportunities that come with the students developing images of empathy, even for a fictional character. And finally, the role of choreographing user interactions to explain where the students feel vulnerable and empowered by the design. Interestingly enough, these learnings overlap with the guidelines for creating and using an alter ego for performance. So Todd Herman is an award-winning performance expert who wrote the Alter Ego Effect, which is a guide to creating and using an alter ego that unlocks your full self. And he backs this process with research together with his experience as a performance coach. And the alter ego or the this other identity that a person takes on in their imagination allows them to detach from limiting beliefs and feel empowered. So to use Herman's words, it unlocks the part of you that feels like you're doing what you want, doing it for your own inspiring reasons, and you get caught up in the flow of the activity or become immersed. Um, to develop uh, an alter ego uh, and with it the opportunity to unlock your whole self, you first choose a field of play. So your alter ego serves you with a specific area in your life. So you choose to develop it for work or for school. Um, you then um, develop clarity about your mission for this field of play, which is the big picture of what you consider success. And you reprogram your limiting beliefs by imagining an alter ego that you know would excel at this mission. You chose a mission and you chose a character or an alter ego that you know would excel at this mission, which if I wanted to become a genius marketeer, I might adopt Steve Jobs as an alter ego. And finally, then you activate your imagined alter ego through a token or other potential strategies that focus on helping you visualize and emotionally engage with this alter ego and, and the backstory of the alter ego. So through this process of adopting an alter ego, Todd Herman has helped clients to become optimistic, resilient, and creative, which is interesting because these positive outcomes correspond directly with the three dimensions of character 
that we would like to strengthen the students because they shown to have an impact on um, success and well-being of students. So knowing this, I'd like you to reimagine Todd Herman's model using it for students in VR. So in the field of play, um, the field of play here is then a virtual classroom. And the mission is based on the learning objectives and um, the learning objectives for the class and the desired uh, character strengths of interpersonal, intrapersonal, and intellectual skills. The virtual classroom is designed to be emotionally engaging and empowering. Students design their avatars to counter limiting beliefs and set true to cognitive empathy for their alter ego. And finally, they embody that avat the avatar and their alter ego by becoming immersed in the virtual classroom environment. So this would potentially allow us to shortcut the mental visualization that Todd Herman uses for an alter ego um, and access that heroic self and detach from limiting beliefs by using virtual reality. Now, whether it actually does, two colleagues and I, Shireen Karia and Mona Kassam, are investigating in a research project currently. We recently received funding from Hamad bin Khalifa University's Innovation Center to counter the impact of COVID and investigate innovative strategies in education. And as I mentioned um, at the beginning of this presentation, I'm currently holding class discussions in VR. And when it comes to my students, it seems that 50% fall into the category of, I love this, I love collaborating in virtual reality, and 50% are actually telling me that they would prefer to work on Zoom. So what I'm really interested in finding out is whether VR in education is here to stay or is just an unpleasant side effect of this pandemic. Thank you. That's a fascinating presentation, Miriam. Thank you for sharing this interesting, uh, this personality It's really to, like the alter ego is specifically, it's a really new, a new concept for me. So thank you. Now I do want to make sure to check the Q and A. Nope, seeing no questions. Your presentation was outstanding. So this wraps up the education session of the Frameless Symposium. And next we will be moving to the hubs rooms. The information, the links are posted in the chat. So you can click there and go straight to the hubs. And again, for deaf attendees, please choose hub room number one if you want to have an interpreter present. Thank you. And I'll hand it back to you, Susan. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you to all your presenters. It was an amazing session. Um, as Wendy said, the uh, hubs links I put in the chat, and then um, after you uh, engage in the hubs rooms with our presenters, we have yoga at noon for a little rebalance from the screen fatigue. Um, you do not have to be a um, expert or even have ever done yoga. You don't need a mat. Uh, she will just be sharing a, a brief uh, exercises you can do to kind of counterbalance the screen. So thanks, everybody. And um, we will see you in hubs. <laughs>